All right, so let me start by thanking Katerina Lagos and André Guerrero de Matos for the kind invitation and for giving me the opportunity to share with you some early thoughts from um, an ongoing research that um, I have been conducting with my colleague Eleni Uki on the making of popular beliefs regarding Greece's dictatorial, most recent dictatorial past. So today I would like us to revisit the belief in the ideological commonality between uh, the colonel's junta and the regime of uh, Colonel of uh, General Medexas on the basis of the supposed uh, share fascist ideology. Uh, so I will do so by first presenting, <coughs> sharing with you some, dis considering some key instances in the making of that belief, uh, and then I will ask in the second part of my presentation what happens to that belief if we approach it from the uh, perspective of uh, st statues to Ioannis Metaxas that uh, the junta uh, either erected or tried to and did not uh, during the seven year period. So I'll start. Um, I would like us now to return to uh, 1972 and more specifically the evening of April 19th uh, when the urban guerrilla group Lea blew up the bust of Ioannis Metaxas in the district of Coquina, present day Nikia, in Piraeus. And attacking statues uh, was certainly not a rarity at the time of the dictatorship, but Lea's attack was most, one of the most imaginative and years later a source of much pride uh, for its members. So in a true ancient Greek fashion, the bomb was hidden in a wreath that was placed in the statue's head. And as per revolutionary tradition, uh, the explosion of the crown statue was followed by a communique in which the perpetrators justified their actions. And I quote from that uh, communique, which you can read in Ask Him. I think it's also available online. So today, Leia's fighters blew up the statue of fascist Metaxas, which was erected by the junta and its August 4th minions in the district where they themselves during the Nazi occupation were snitching on patriots to Hitler's execution squads while wearing hoods. So this is a direct quote from, from the communicant. So for Lea, the best uh, in Coquina signified the celebration of the darkest pages of Greek history and in particular of the previous military dictatorship of August 4th, 1936. And unlike many others, the Guerrillas did not consider, of course, Metaxas a heroic figure who opposed Mussolini's uh, demand to uh, occupy important strategic locations uh, in Greece with a, with a single word, uh, Rather, his bust demonstrated for Lea's guerrillas how the colonels who engineered the coup d'etat honor the memory of a previous dictator and work with his supporters whom they viewed as former Nazi collaborators. But if we read beyond the obvious um, meaning of this communique, one could easily understand how attacking the statue of Metaxas uh, was also meant uh, as an attack at the junta itself. For such action as I will try to show both insinuates and also creates an ideological affinity uh, between the two regimes. Now, even a cursory examination of contemporary discourse on the junta shows how this particular understanding, Lea's understanding of the regime as ideological kin to that of Ioannis Metaxas, 
how now has nowadays become rather mainstream, and most importantly, dictates uh, that a proper examination of the junta's ideology should start in 1936. So let us see how such certainty over the historical significance and the analytic uh, productivity of this comparative framework finds expression in the following statements taken from both uh, uh, from recent scholarly and journalistic accounts of the period. So the first one comes from the work of uh, Mika Haritos Faturos, uh, where she states the nationalism of the Junta's propaganda campaign relied heavily on the Greek Orthodox religion and on the pre-war fascist nationalism of Metaxas. Another statement coming from uh, Hagen Fleischer's article, uh, the colonels saw themselves as heirs of Metaxa, as did the uh, anti-junta resistance, which set a bomb by Metaxas statue on the eve of April 1970. He misstates the, uh, the attack. Uh, another from a journalist, Mikhailidis, the kinship of the colonel's junta to Metaxas's dictatorship is telling. The majority of the dictatorship's high-ranking officers had graduated from military academies. Uh, and another one um, during the rule of uh, August 4th. And another one comes from um, a journalist called Dimitris Magnatis, who wrote in an article titled Epikera Yagella Ke Yaklamata, builds this connection between um, Metaxas and the kernels on the basis of kitsch. Now this is a concept that entered the Greek public discourse in the mid-1980s and I believe that this happened on the part of certain um, art critics and I especially refer to Dimitris Raftopoulos in order to facilitate a connection between the junta, totalitarianism, fascism, and facilitate most importantly comparisons between the junta and uh, Hitler's Germany and Mussolini's Italy. So um, Magnatis writes, uh, he of course draws on um, uh, Milan Kunder as the unbear uh, novel, The Unbearable Lightness of Being, which became very popular in Greece right from the moment it was uh, translated into Greek and at, at that time I think it was seen as being as a kind of work that was imbued with profound philosophical uh, meanings. And so drawing on that he says death was the very tyranny of the kernels and kitsch is the connecting material of the two conditions. This kitsch was very present and was influencing the people through popular image and dissemination in the infamous film Epikera. This is the newsreels of the junta, which nonetheless do not start with the nation saving April 21st, 1967, but have a long history. State Epikera make their debut in uh, 1936 at the time of Metaxas's dictatorship. So here you see another example of how this connection between junta the Junta and Metaxas is, is facilitated, is made. Uh, so while these views establish these connections between the kernels, fascism, and Metaxas, I think it is important to keep in mind that they were not unquestionably endorsed at the time of the Junta. In fact, some of its most vocal opponents abroad, such as Nikos Fulazas in France, or uh, Richard Clogg, in uh, London, or uh, journalist uh, Nerio Minuso in, uh, in Italy, uh, strongly opposed this idea, this, this tendency on the part of the regime's opponent to describe the regime as fascist. So to give you an example, Pulazas already in 1969 in a letter to Poria, and this is a magazine published by Greek students in Paris, makes clear that the colonel's rules uh, mustn't be confused with fascism and that they should rather be categorized as a military dictatorship. While Claude in his 1972 article, this is part of an edited volume titled Greece Under Military Rule, if I'm not uh, mistaken, provides a very, very detailed analysis 
um, of the regime's discourses and practices in order, again, to discourage its opponents from calling it fascist. In fact, it is, this is the very starting point of his uh, article on the ideology of the junta, a rather detailed refutation of that belief. Uh, but how exactly did the idea that the junta is linked to Ioannis Metaxas on the basis of a shared fascist ideology come to be? And to answer this question, I will now examine the different intellectual trajectories that the regime's opponents in Greece and abroad followed in order to delegitimize the junta through the analytics of fascism and neo-fascism. Um, while these naturally these discursive paths have very different points of departure, they, as we will see, uh, around 72 or like early 73, they converge uh, to present the junta as heir of the interwar dictator's ideology. So in this context, as I said in the very beginning of this presentation, I will revisit four uh, key instances in the making of the belief that the junta, again, was a fascist regime similar to that of Ioannis Metaxas, even though, of course, I could have picked other statements, or one could have been perhaps the obvious, to show how already from the start uh, the regime was imagined as a fascist regime. Um, so let me start with the story of uh, Spiros Linardatos' book, Pos Eftasame Stil Tetarti Augusto, how we ended up at August 4th, which shows again, as I said, how from the very start, leftist circles imagined the colonel's regime as a reincarnation of Metaxas's dictatorship. The book was published in 65. And it discusses how inherently conservative, uh, the inherently conservative stance of prominent Greek politicians and high-ranking civil servants constituted the fertile ground for Metaxas's anti-communist and anti-parliamentarian discourse, and eventually led to the dictatorship of August 4th, 1936. Now, at the time of the coup d'etat, uh, there, was no, there was not much demand for that book. But in any case, just to be safe, the regime banned it uh, <laughs> from circulation in like a couple of months after the, the coup d'etat. But of course, this kind of prohibition had the exact opposite results, and the book regained popularity. So to his surprise, Leonardatus, who at the time was, of course, already uh, moved to uh, Leros, the Parthenon, um, he finds out from other uh, dangerous citizens who are also become displaced and end up uh, in the camp of Parthenon in Leros that there is demand for the book, and he's rather, rather surprised. Um, so it is important to emphasize how right, right after April 21st, a book about an interwar dictator had gained contemporary significance for what the author describes as an anti-fascist readership. So if you, if you read the, the prologue that he authored for subsequent publications uh, in, in the late, um, in 2000, Eight and 2009 by Tobima, he makes very explicit that this was a work that was addressing an anti-fascist readership. Um, and, and why is that the case? Because I think that understanding in this context how we ended up at August 4th was by analogy crucial to understanding how we ended up at April 21st. Now, to fully understand the emergence of the belief in the regime's ideological commonality, one should also look beyond the confines of Greece and consider the impacts of works published abroad. And at this point, I would like us to recall uh, Yanis Katris's book on the imposition of the dictatorship in Greece. 
and this again was um, widely uh, uh, like the, the 1971 publication uh, was uh, titled Genesis to Neofascism in Elada, and it was published uh, in Geneva. And then, and then in uh, 19, like a couple of months after that publication, uh, it was published in the United States under the title Eyewitness Account, uh, an eyewitness account, and and right after the restoration of democracy was uh, published uh, by Papa Zizis multiple times. But Catrice, uh, so the book was widely read in Europe and the US and represents, I believe, a key moment in the history of anti-dictatorial struggle. It constitutes the popular testament to a widespread feeling amongst, amongst those who had memories of the Second World War, the subsequent civil war, and the systematic uh, persecution of the left, that the kernel scoop was the imposition of a new type of fascism, a neo-fascism. Uh, these analytics were readily embraced not only by concerned European and American citizens, but also by intellectual giants, such as Hannah Arendt, who would write uh, in the New York Review of Books that the imposition of uh, a military dictatorship in Greece was the direct outcome of the wiping out of the Greek resistance organization of, uh, during uh, of World War II. And I owe this reference to Fotini. Uh, in this case, too, the time was right for such understandings of the country's predicament. Yet, neo-fascism is an elusive concept uh, in Catrice's book, and at no point does the author provide us with a concrete definition. Rather, it is the reader who has to infer that neo-fascism simultaneously refers to an updated version of interwar fascism, U.S. interventionism, and plans for global domination, the colonel's own experience of Metaxas's regime, and the activities of the Greek deep state in serving the interests of an, of an economic oligarchy. And it is most likely this last feature of Catrice's neo-fascism that explains why the book, uh, the, uh, the American uh, edition of the book, starts with a warm endorsement by Vasilis Vasilikos, whose novel on the role of the deep state in the assassination of Grigoris Labakis in uh, 1963 became the basis for Gavras's 69 film Z. Now, Vasilikos had no qualms as to what was happening in Greece under the colonels. And now I quote from, the, from his introduction. Uh, he says, the book you're holding, so he's addressing the reader, uh, the book you're holding in your hands was not written to amaze you. Like its earlier counterpart, counterpart The Birth of Fascism by Angelo Tasca, political exile of the Mussolini years, it describes the almost mathematical political equation that leads inevitably to dictatorship. And a year later, after, Catrice, after the publication of Catrice's book, now it's in 1972, the release of uh, Theo Angelopoulos' Days of 36 crystallized the belief in the shared fascist ideology of the Junta and Metaxas. This film is an elusive narrative for the days of 1963, 36-63, and the outbreak of parastate activity. Now, indicatively, the movie opens with the assassination of a trade unionist. So like Vasilikos and Gavras, Angelopoulos suggests that there is an ongoing relationship between the state and the parastate which at critical moments leads to authoritarian political solutions. From this point of view, the affinity between the Junta and Metaxas's regime is just a matter of analogy. The same historical mechanism um, that led to Metaxas enabled the colonels to come to power, and, and uh, viewers uh, arrive at such conclusion by virtue of the larger historical context. So there's no need for an, a very explicit 
connection between the two regimes. But but uh, but but uh, Angelopoulos uses the elliptic language of film and symbolism to establish that connection on several different levels. So this is just a still from the film, and you see that the politician is as short as Metaxa, so you're supposed to, to, to perhaps make the connection there. And you see that um, this perhaps looks like Aeon. Uh, the Metaxa says, um, youth organization, but this whole ceremony takes place uh, in uh, Turkovunia, and this was the location that the regime had designated for the construction of one of its most important projects that would completely transform Athenian geography in the nations via this mega modernist megachurch. So so if, if, if you are somewhat familiar with, with Greek history and you follow politics at the time, then it is very easy to make to see the connection between Metaxas and the kernels. And a month after the release of uh, Agelopoulos' film, and now it's March 1972, Günter Grass's speech in Athens further popularized the belief in the connection between the junta, Metaxas, and fascism. Now, the very title of the novel is Public Address, and I'm going to use my German accent. Now. So there's a speech against custom, echoed uh, Hannah Arendt's concept of the banality of evil, and alluded to the ways in which totalitarianism becomes embedded in the mundane. As for his introductory comments, these leave little room for misunderstanding since all of the crucial elements are there. Metaxas, the kernels, Germany's painful relationship to democracy, which is a formulation directly pointing at his country's Nazi past. So, and Grasch uh, remarked, there is no need for a foreigner to explain to you how it became possible for the dictatorship of August uh, 1936 to be revived. Which, uh, which of those in power are capable enough to play today Metaxas's role and why history in its repetition stages its tragedies as a farce? Greeks and Germans have a painful, ill-fortune relation to democracy, a relation that every so often uh, was interrupted and do not have a straightforward evolution. So let me now move to the second part of my presentation and ask what happens to this belief in the ideological commonality between the two regimes on the basis of a supposed shared fascist ideology if we look at the micro histories of uh, statues honoring uh, metaxas that were erected during the junta. So let us now return again to Lea's attack in Cotunia and ask what happens to this belief uh, if we consider the micro histories of statues of metaxas that were either built during the junta or were planned but never materialized. And who exactly initiated their construction and with what purposes? Let me start with a brief chronology. The first monument of Metaxas that was announced to be built during the junta uh, in 1968 was a statue in Arvostoli, the capital of the island of Kefalonia and the dictator's family's place of origin. This, however, wasn't the first time that the construction of such a monument had been announced. The project had commenced at least seven years earlier, in 1961. And, of course, the fact that such an initiative could be taken in the years preceding the dictatorship raises yet another important question for understanding Hunter's, uh, Hunter's actions within the continuum of Greek history. What was the place of Metaxas's memory prior to the coup d'etat of 1967. And in this 
respect, it is important to note that Metaxas was not immediately discredited after his death in 1941. While there are many reasons for this, uh, we should be attentive to the particular conditions of the post-Civil War period, which brought about a broader anti-communist alliance. Um, indeed, the post-war years, uh, in the post-war years, an idealized picture of Metaxas dominated, and he was presented as the leader of the war that Greece fought against Italy and fascism, and the man who outrightly rejected Mussolini's ultimatum. This one-sided portrayal of Metaxas as a great national leader effectively prevented any in-depth examination of his political deeds, not only on the part of the right, but also on the part of the liberal political space. What is more, during the first post-war period, Metaxas's regime was not described as fascist, except, of course, by the left. Uh, and indeed, many intellectuals and journalists and politicians were reluctant to acknowledge the more sinister aspects of uh, the August 4th regime and its possible ideological connections to fascism at the time of, and because this was a time of, of Cold War anti-communism. And it is this attitude that made it possible in 1961 for this initiative to erect a bust of Metaxas in his hometown in Kefalonia to be undertaken. As we have already seen, the project did not make much progress until 68, when a new fundraising committee undertook its construction. In the following months, similar initiatives were announced uh, throughout Greece, in different parts of Greece. So in March 1969, a fundraising committee was established for the construction of uh, yet another statue of Metaxas in Kifisia, an upper class suburb of Athens where he, he had resided. In October of the same year, another bus was inaugurated in Lixuri, the second biggest city in Kefalonia. Uh, that uh, in 1970, the municipality of Thessaloniki, we know that was looking for an appropriate space to install a bust of Metaxas. And in addition, several newspaper articles that were published after the restoration of democracy uh, that discuss uh, citizens' protest against the existence of busts of Metaxas in different parts of Greece uh, bring to our attention that there were busts in Halandri, in Farsala, and of course in Cotunia. And it is from these articles that we know that this past also existed there. So it thus seems that the junta somehow cleared the road for those who were nostalgic for Metaxas to honor his memory. Nevertheless, it is uncertain whether these projects express local initiatives or reflect centrally taken decisions. When observing their spatial allocation, we see that uh, Metaxas's monuments were established um, either in small towns or in the capital city suburbs. So again, the question is, did these uh, initiatives indicate that the regime, that the colonels were modeling uh, themselves after Metaxas or even that they had disposed fascism? Let us consider this question from the perspective of a group that clearly had a fascist ideology at the time of the junta and was systematically advocating the construction of Metaxas's monument in Athens, namely the uh, Tetarchy Augusto, the 4th August group. Now, this group was first appeared in 65 as a political party, but it was dissolved along with all other political parties after the coup d'etat. Its members, however, continued to operate under the leadership of Ioannis Ladas, one of the junta's you no know, key members, and soon they began to openly demand the construction of uh, a Metaxas statue in Sindagma Square, which they also suggested should be renamed to Metaxas Square, and since they argued that there's really no reason to honor an abolished constitution, but there's every reason to honor Metaxas. 
And this particular demand for a large statue that would be placed in the very center of Athens, and in a way at the very core of Greek political history, shows how different the goals and ambitions of this group were from honoring the memory of, of Metaxas. This demand, however, uh, for the construction of a large statue in central Athens never materialized since that would have clearly shown that the regime was ideologically linked to the interwar dictator. The only monument that was centra uh, centrally considered was the so-called monument to the advancers of No, uh, memorializing Greece's rejection of Italy's ultimatum. Let me outline what we know about that particular monument. First, the head of the project's committee was Dimitris Patiris, the second vice president at the time. Second, uh, it seems that the project was not really publicized, even though the committee would meet very, very often. So this is something that we know from the archives of the municipality of Athens. Uh, and third, from the minutes of this discussions, we know that the monument was first conceived as uh, conceived of as comprising three statues, depicting Field Marshal Papagos, King George II, and Metaxas, placed on a single pedestal, thus presenting Greece's norm to Italy as a collective decision, and in a way granting equal honor to the main actors of the war 1940-1941. So in sum, uh, until 1970, some high-ranking uh, members of the junta were directly or indirectly involved in projects memorializing Metaxas. And I should here say that uh, Ladas and Patilis, but also the, the position of Patakos was rather ambivalent. And I'm mentioning uh, Patakos because he was the one oversighting the activities of uh, the municipality of Athens. So and he was, it seemed that he was okay with what was happening. Uh, but what is interesting is that the principal leader, Georgios Papadopoulos, on the other hand, kept his distance from such initiatives and was never involved. Now, Papadopoulos identified uh, instead with Eleftherios Venizelos, the prominent liberal politician who emerged from the revolution of 1909. And in fact, the largest monument that the junta managed to complete in Athens, which stands to this very day, was the statue of Eleftherios Venizelos on Kifisias Avenue. And this is from the inauguration. So we see Papadopoulos standing in front of the uh, statue of Venizelos. Even during the years when honors towards Metaxas multiplied, and these include also the renaming of streets or, or uh, the official endorsement of funerals organized by August 4th, um, the most consistent official effort of the regime was to present itself as a democratic rule in waiting. This is why officially the regime presented itself as a repetition of the revolution of 1909, the army movement which like the coup of uh, April 21st began in the uh, Woody barracks, and coincidence that was constantly highlighted and led to the modernization of political life and the army and eventually to the triumph of the Balkan Wars. After 1971, the expressions of honor to Metaxas ceased. Again, the political conjecture may give us an explanation. In, in 1971, Papadopoulos had managed to defeat his rivals within the regime and to neutralize them. So in that context, uh, Ioannis Ladas found himself being the, the uh, deputy minister and regional commander in Thessaly, which was an honorary position, which was completely deprived of any actual political power. So he got rid of Ladas. Uh, 
A year later, Papadopoulos became regent, and thus further securing his position against his rivals. And as we know, he started to pursue a policy of controlled liberalization. At the end of that year, he made a very indicative statement, and I quote, we did not create a one-party state. We did not create a youth organization. We did not follow a totalitarian constitution. So Papadopoulos, though he did not refer to any specific names, was clearly expressing his distance from a state ideal such as the one that Metaxas had created. The political vision of Papadopoulos was to create a semi-democratic regime with no references to a fascist past. Although such an initiative seemed to succeed in Athens, in the northern provinces, uh, or I should say in the border, in some border areas, many officers who had been disappointed by Papadopoulos' attempts to liberalize the regime and thought that he was really betraying the cause of the revolution, um, repeatedly showed their disagreement towards the regime with symbolic gestures such as the renaming of streets in honor of Metaxas because they knew that this would really upset him, and by erecting monuments in his memory. So it comes as little surprise that the monument that was planned for the capital city was realized in the borderlands, which were under army units strongly opposing Papadopoulos. The most faithful reproduction of that design, the design that was proposed for Athens, was erected in Kalpaki, uh, the location from which the Greek army launched its counterattack against the Italian forces. And uh, as the original design suggested, it includes three busts of King George II, Papagos and Metaxas, all sharing a common pedestal. There is only a slight variation uh, in the title, the initial project was uh, termed Monument to the Advances of No, whereas in the Kalpaki version it is called Tomnimia to Olsu. Now there was another uh, uh, monument to Ohi, uh, this time uh, erected uh, in Rupel, and it is interesting because it depicts uh, Ioannis Metaxas, who was dead when that battle took place. So you see that this is a very particular and very strong statement. Um, it's, it's, it's not just a past. It is, it is a development uh, of a different order. So in this presentation, I revisited the belief that the colonel's regime shared the common fascist ideology with the dictatorship of Metaxas. And as we saw, even though influential historians and political scientists opposed the belief at the time of the junta, it survives to this day, sometimes as a self-evident truth, and informs both lay and academic accounts of the period. But instead of examining the fallacies of that belief, or, or affirming or challenging existing classifications of the kernels junta, we focused on its genealogy and looked at the ways in which ideas circulate and eventually converge through publications and films and, and public speeches. I could have also mentioned the posters of anti-dictatorial struggle because there you see say no to fascism again, like very vividly depicted. So my main goal was to show that the comparison of the junta to Metaxas on the basis of a fascist ideology allowed the colonel's opponents to understand their predicament, classify the junta, and present it to the world, and ultimately appeal for international support. As we have seen, the making of this belief was by no means a straightforward process and depended on a series of omissions, discursive gaps, silences, misunderstandings of the junta, internal dynamics, and generalizations of the nature of its activities. In most cases, we see a transitive logic at work. If Metaxas was fascist, and the junta resembles his regime, 
then the kernels are fastest too. This is an example of a transit of logic. But how did the junta itself view its relationship to the former dictators? So in order to answer this question, as we just looked at the micro histories of statues that were built in honor of Metaxas during the Liepta idea. And, and I think that here there is an opportunity for us to, to touch on certain uh, theoretical issues concerning the materiality of memory. And, and to show that we can do something different with statues, that statues are not just sites where the past crystallizes, but we can see, we can place the building of statues in the course of developments and political machinations and to see them as very important material statements, as part of a very heated debate that takes place at various different levels, sometimes with words, but some other times through the establishment of statues. And even though the, there can be no doubt that the Pooch allowed all the new admirers of Metaxas to pay tribute to him, a careful examination of the way in which they did so shows that they did not transcend the bounds of the pre-dictatorial period. It is for this reason that the various basts that made their appearance in different parts of Greece after 68 celebrate first and foremost Metaxas's contribution to the war, but it's not about a, a third Hellenic civilization. It's they, they portray him as a great national leader who led the war against the Italians. So the few exceptions to this party, like the group of the Tarti of Wustu, remain the marginal phenomenon that primarily reflected the intense oppositions within the regime. And I think that this is the biggest problem with the belief in the ideological connection between Metaxas and the kernels on the basis of fascism. It prevents us from understanding the politics of the dictatorship in the conjuncture of its era and ultimately the regime's ideology. So as we have seen, the junta's history was in the making from the very first moment of the coup d'etat, when the first interpretations of what was happening in Greece were articulated. And as was to be expected, these interpretations drew on historical points of reference, such as Metaxas's dictatorship. In this way, while dissidents tried to make sense of their contemporary predicament, they also laid the foundations for a reconsideration of the past, of also of metaxas, of fascism, and the political problem that, uh, that, that had led uh, to uh, World War II. The regime's opponents called the junta fascist not in an attempt, of course, to engage in a theoretical discussion, but in order to challenge this idea that the West is this, this space of perfect freedom. And this was part of a larger tendency to reconsider fascism at the time and constituted a moment of self-criticism and reflection for the West that presupposed the shattering of post-war balances. In Greece, this particular, in, in particular, this moment of reflection facilitated the reconsideration and re-evaluation of its recent history. So for this reason, it is important to be aware and the binary manner in which the belief in the shared fascist ideology between August 1st and, and April 21st operated. Because through this belief, it wasn't just the junta that became identified with Metaxas, but also Metaxas with the junta. And as a result, the pre-dictatorial discourse that portrayed Metaxas as a national leader and brought about the exaltation of his memory collapsed after the restoration of democracy. So by the mid-1980s, it was certainly not considered appropriate to claim that the no was said by Metaxas, but rather that it was articulated by the people. So thank you very much.